Welcome to Confessions of a Stenographer, where we are focusing on all things steno and the legal profession. Thanks for tuning in. I am your co-host, April Biederman, and I will be speaking with Anna Fatima Costa today. But before we get into our interview, here is a little about me. I'm a court reporting student and intern. I'm located in Tacoma, Washington, and I go to Green River College in Auburn. I'm testing at 180 words per minute in literary Q&A and jury charge. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Anna Fatima Costa. Hi, Anna. Are you ready to confess? Hi, April. Well, I've got to confess that that word brings up some anxiety in me. During my eight years in Catholic elementary and secondary schools, I was required to confess my sins to a priest every week before being allowed to accept the sacrament at Sunday Mass. The second dictionary definition of to confess is, quote, admit or acknowledge something reluctantly, typically because one feels slightly ashamed or embarrassed. I guess some of what I will say today may be tinged with embarrassment or shame. So, yes, I am ready to confess. Awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing it. So who is Anna Fatima Costa? Tell us about your life, your background, your court reporting journey. Um, um, thank you. Who am I? That's the ultimate question, right? Mm -hmm. many, many of us ask that of ourselves. And practically from the time we are born, we are told who we are, who, whom we will be, and what kind of life we should live. Our souls know who we are and, and will guide us if we listen. The answer is I am a highly sensitive, intuitive, spiritual person who has felt like an outsider for many years in my life, probably because of my early traumatic uprooting from my homeland and several traumas throughout my life. I was born on Madeira Island, Portugal, off the northwest coast of Africa, where I spent the first seven years of my life. At the age of seven, my family and I, and I was a middle child of five, two older brothers, two younger sisters, left late one night during a storm. You can visualize the movie. Off the pier of uh, Funchal, the main city of Madeira Island, and we boarded a little boat to a ship just off the shallow waters and crossed the Atlantic it took 11 days to New York and then three days by train to California, where my father's elder sisters resided in East Oakland. My father, Eugenio Costa, that's the correct Portuguese pronunciation of my name, uh, was a journalist on Medeta and um, a very popular journalist with a loyal following. And a couple of years after we arrived, he created a weekly radio program, Amigos de Portugal, for 30 years with followers throughout the U.S., Canada, and Portugal. I can remember April. You want to hear a funny story? Absolutely. <laughs> so one Saturday morning, I hear a lot of uh, a ruckus out on our driveway, and I open up the front door, and there's my dad setting up a stand-up microphone and there's a band behind him and he's standing in front of Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane and they went on to perform White Rabbit right there in front of our home in the driveway. It was mind-blowing. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> So as a teenager, I fell in love with the original Perry Mason show, was absolutely riveted to the TV, loved the dramatic court scenes. And I wondered about the gentleman in a suit sitting at a tiny table under the judge's bench 
with a machine in front of him. And occasionally he would read back. After high school, I attended Merritt Junior College in the Oakland Hills and decided to study nursing. I did that for two years until I realized that I felt lightheaded at the sight of blood. So there went that. I went ahead and got my AA in general studies and felt totally lost. And then one day, my boyfriend, who worked ahead at um, a law firm part-time, came home one day excited. He told me that he had seen a transcript sitting on his secretary's desk with a sizable invoice in it. So he asked one of the attorneys, you know, what is this? What is court reporting? And the attorney told him that court reporters are very much needed. And they make a good living. So my boyfriend gave me the number of that agency. I called, made an appointment, went in and spoke to the owner, who spent an hour telling me all about the amazing uh, aspects of being a reporter and all, everything that is required to be one. And it just so happened there was a reporting school around the corner that offered a free week with a rental machine, no strings. So how could I pass that up? I went in, tried it out for a week, absolutely fell in love. And I signed up. It was Oakland College of Court Reporting, which had an amazing reputation for students going on to pass the CSR the first time. I worked full time and attended three nights a week, three hours at a time. And then I would go home and practice two more hours. Three and a half years later, I failed to qualify her by seven points. I was crushed. And because then the California CSR exam, which is the most difficult exam in the U.S. from everything I've heard, was given twice a year in May in San Francisco and in November down in L.A. So I didn't want to go to LA, but I had no choice. This was May when I failed. So now I had six months. Soon after that, I saw a flyer at school for reporters. And it was a certificate of merit class that was being offered by my favorite teacher, David Harini. And they were going to be writing uh, up to 300 words a minute. And a light bulb went off. I realized that if I could sit in and build at my speed another 25 words a minute before November, I would have a cushion of 25 words. Um, so in case I froze, I didn't want to pass by the skin of my teeth. So I approached the teacher and he agreed. And meanwhile, the last three months of school, I interned at the former Oakland Municipal Court with lead reporter Eugene Troy and his second, Lois Lambert. So in November 1979, I decided that I wanted to take the RPR, which was being offered six days before the CSR and, I, and, and all legs at that time. All legs in one weekend for wow, both. Okay. Yeah. So I had been really doubling down on my studies the last six months, um, applying the practice regimen that I'll share later. Uh, and uh, I went ahead and took both of them and passed both the first time. Before I even got my cert, certificate, Eugene Troy offered me a job to go work at the municipal board, which was really amazing. So I, pro <laughs> Thanks. I pro tamed in court for three months, then went into depots and public hearings. Um, and I just wanted to get every job that I could for the experience. 
I eventually I specialized in medical depositions because I love medical and medical peer reviews. Over the years, then later, uh, my third husband was a court reporter. I took some time off after having my second son with him, um, who is a lawyer and living in Florida. And after um, we separated, I got a job as office manager for the San Francisco office of what was then known as interim court reporting. I did that for five and a half years and then transitioned to sales, a sales executive for 10 plus years for two global agencies. Eventually, I took some time off to write my ebook after I left that agency. And I went on to take a job for a small three to five lawyer law firm working as litigation secretary for a 30 year partner. That was an eye opening experience to be on the inside of a law firm. And then finally, most recently for three years, I was the office administrator for a 50 year forensic psychiatrist and expert witness, um, highly in demand by lawyers throughout the US and abroad. You really do like your medical. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, can, I can see that trend. That's amazing. I do too. Um, so Anna, tell me about your publications and presentations and webinars you've done, your ebook coaching you provide. Tell me all about that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for asking. So I'll, I'll, I'll go, um, I'll just share a little bit about each. Uh, I've written a, a couple of dozen articles which have been published in various legal media like the Bar Association of San Francisco, where I have sat on the board of the paralegal section since uh, its inception in 2014. Um, also, the San Francisco Trial Lawyers Magazine, the Trial Lawyer, the CCRA Online, and Legal Professionals Incorporated. They recently changed their name from Legal Secretaries Incorporated. It's an association of legal secretaries and paralegals and other support um, individuals uh, throughout California, and also in myriad other periodicals. These articles have been primarily to educate the legal community about core reporting. Uh, NCRA has mentioned a couple of them on the GCR.com, and during the first impeachment trial, I published an article on LinkedIn. Thank you, Steno woman in white blazer. And the subtitle, we are Steno. This is why we are still here, which just got picked up by LLRX, an archival legal database with 10,000 readers. About my presentations, I've given workshops since 2004 to law firms, legal associations, the Bar of San Francisco, and other venues, again, to educate the legal community and the general public about the ethics of being a court reporter, the impact of contracting and gifting on our profession and theirs, how crucial we are to the field of law, the importance of court reporters speaking up for the integrity of the record and other topics. I forgot to mention that in 2015, in my publications, I wrote and self published my ebook, Zero to 225 Year Guide to Writing Mastery, which is available as a free down download. <coughs> Excuse me. Part two are my five golden rules to steno mastery. Number one, write cleanly, drop, repeat. Number two, punctuate as you write. Number three, finger drills and exercises. Number four, slow down to speed up. 
And number five, write 50 plus words per minute above your current speed. Applying all of those practices resulted in my passing the RPR and the CSR easily the first time. I didn't call for them my five golden rules back then. I only started calling them when I began working with students. In that ebook, I also share how to overcome five common stumbling blocks, negative self-talk, inconsistent progress, personal challenges, lack of motivation, and lack of support and understanding. My ebook has been downloaded 4,500 times so far, and I offer a complimentary Steno Mastery Strategy session for anyone who downloads it. And I created a course around those golden rules, which I hope to offer this year again and produce videos. With regard to my coaching in 2009, I participated in a week long training that incorporated the teachings of Dr. Marshall Rosenberg author of Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life, and the founder of the International Organization Center for Nonviolent Communication. That sounds amazing. Um, I know from personal experience that your ebook is incredibly helpful. I mean, it's exactly what I needed when I was in a plateau from 140 to 160, and I found your ebook, and then I read it a couple times, and then I heard that you were offering uh, mock depot internships for students, and I contacted you, and I was terrified <laughs> at the time, but um, <laughs> you walked me through it, you helped, you know, train all of us, and prepped us, and everything, and so... I know my experience at the mock was amazing um, and incredibly invaluable at the time. I, I needed it to propel me forward. So you're still doing the Berkeley Law mock depots at UC Berkeley. And then there's also mock trials through the San Francisco Trial Lawyers Association and Golden Gate University. So tell us about those and how do students sign up and you know what do you provide for the students okay well thank you april do you want to share what your first experience was like before i do that sure <laughs> <laughs> you mean the day of yes oh yeah i just remember um not being able to breathe on my drive over <laughs> <laughs> to berkeley not being able to breathe the entire time and then I found you and I was just a bundle of nerves and I was I was hot I was cold and I couldn't think and and I still couldn't breathe and then <laughs> and then you um I believe you gathered us up in a circle and we all held hands and we all breathed together you know profound breathing kind of like box breathing and uh and I was to be, we, all of us students, we were to be the reporter of record, not shadowing a licensed reporter. So I think that in a way that made it easier because it was on me, you know, the, the obligation fell on me to capture the record and to speak up when I wasn't getting it. And so I continued to breathe and I believe I had a fairly moderate speaker for the first student, so I got lucky. And um, I only had to speak up a couple of times, and they were very, um, they were very gracious about it. And after, after the first three sessions, which were about 10 minutes each, we would take a break. Everyone would take a break. And I remember just floating out of that room and you were waiting for me and I was I was floating on clouds I believe you remember this yes <laughs> I was on clouds just you know and, and angels were playing harps in the background and I was I was smiling so big it was all teeth and you were like <laughs> I was just a face with teeth 
And you were like, how did it go? And I was like, <laughs> I've got this. I can do this, you know, because I was so afraid, you know, going into it that well, I have imposter syndrome. So I was afraid that somebody, one of the students or, you know, one of the partners who was moderating was going to stand up in the middle of the proceedings, point their finger at me and shout, you're a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you're doing <laughs> but that didn't happen and we all got through it together and it was absolutely amazing and um yeah I I did it for four semesters with you at Berkeley Law so I began offering these reporter of record in apprenticeships in 2008 at a law firm in Palo Alto California and I continued to do this for the next 10 years down there, every July. The person training the lawyers happens to be the professor that I continue to work with now, 13, going on 14 years later at Berkeley Law, Professor Henry Hecht, uh, who was one of the original Watergate prosecutors. After we met, it was the first time he had introduced core reporters at his law firm trainings. And from then on, we began working um, every time he had a mock uh, and with his law students. He values the contribution that I and my apprentices offer to his students. So every spring and fall, he teaches a depositions class for 18 law students, 50, that's five zero percent of their grade is determined by how well they apply what he teaches them in their performance during the mock depositions, where they are required to take turns questioning and defending witnesses. There are four days of mock depositions, usually Tuesdays every week or every other week. Uh, in April, uh, I mean, March and April. And there are three rooms each day simultaneously with six law students in each room, a reporter, meaning one of my apprentices, a witness, and either the professor or one of two litigators who act as moderators. The law turn, uh, students take turns questioning and defending the witness. Um, Actually, there are multiple witnesses. My reporter's number one task is to speak up during the Q&As to educate law students and even the litigators in the room that it is their duty to interrupt if for any reason they cannot hear or understand. A few days later, I help my reporters produce rough drafts. Each reporter usually walks away with six rough drafts of approximately 10 to 12 pages each. Do you remember what it was like to work on those roughs, April? Yes. Please share. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's so hard to overcorrect, you know, in a rough because you're supposed to leave it as a rough draft. But I remember you drilling, you know, into me, don't add punctuation, you know, when I, when I was scoping it, you know, just, just to clean up the, the steno and the names and all that. And then because of your ebook, it had changed the way I write. So I always add punctuation as I go along. And one time I thought I was in trouble with you for one of my uh, roughs because you were like, you have to do this over again. It's too clean. You know, and I was like, what are you talking about? And you thought that the punctuation that was in there had been put in during the editing process. And it wasn't. I had written it on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. So yeah, that, that was a huge compliment and gold star for me at the time. Um, yes. but, you know, it's just a really good habit to get into. But yeah, it, it was amazing, an amazing experience and something that I haven't learned at, and I've been to four court reporting schools. I'm on my fourth. And, um, you know, they don't teach us how to produce roughs 
and they certainly don't teach us how to speak up um, for the record, except for except for Green River. They, they do that there, which I appreciate. Um, That's awesome. It's great experience for the real world. It is. So what I provide, uh, you know, students uh, who want to participate, I've also had um, new reporters and even experienced reporters coming back into the field after taking time off is my expertise and support drawing from 40 plus years in the legal field. Uh, they get a guideline booklet that tells them everything they need to know before, during, and after each mock. Sample rough draft templates, including disclaimers, um, case files, exhibits, and participants' names. Uh, the importance of interrupting so my articles uh, that I've written and also best practice pointers from the Court Reporters Board of California, how and when to speak up, transcript reviews and feedback, coaching, breath work, as you mentioned, professional comportment, and even how to write a professional email. In 2019, I learned students dubbed me mock woman. <laughs> that's so, right. That's right. You're the mock woman. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I bought the domain. I love it. I thought it was, well, well, it's great. You know, they can't remember my name because it's a mouthful on a Fatima Kosna. <laughs> so they dubbed me mock woman. Uh, any student interested in being the reporter or an observer can go to mockwoman.com and you'll see dozens of photos of my apprentices there and send me a message if they want to connect or follow the link provided there to sign up. In 2013, I was introduced to the executive, executive director of the San Francisco Draw Lawyers Association by an attorney friend and I decided to join the association. I was then still working in sales, so that would be a good avenue to connect with my potential clients. And I soon learned, soon learned that they had been conducting at SFDLA mock trial competitions of four local law schools for over 20 years. And when I learned they never had core reporters, I spoke with the president and he agreed it would be an excellent win-win opportunity. And then in 2018, I met the director of Golden Gate University School of Law at the SFTLA annual mock trial and where their students often competed. The following year, one of my apprentices reported the final mock trial of April 23, three hour mock trials in a single weekend, an annual competition of 16 law schools nationwide. Holy smokes, 23 mock trials in a weekend. 23 uh, trials? Yes. I wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. <laughs> you heard it correctly. Wow. 23. Yeah. There are double and triple tracking on Friday, Saturday, and then one, the final one on Sunday. And that's the one that mm. my intern reported in 2019 and three did it last year virtually in 2020. So April, do you know why and, and how my apprenticeship program got started? Um. I think I've heard the story before, but I'm not sure. So go ahead and tell me. <laughs> I asked a simple question when I heard each of those organizations offered mock devils and trials. Do you have court reporters? No? Let's talk. In other words, uh, ask and yep. you shall receive. Don't exactly. ask, and you don't get. That's it. 
So Zoom changed everything last year, you know, um, in, in the in the profession, right? I mean, COVID changed the world, but then, you know, Zoom was born out of necessity. Um, using Zoom, it, it wasn't born last year, but so how many interns did you have in the fall of 2020 for your Berkeley Law mock since they were remote and done via Zoom? Well, it, it was it was mind blowing, uh, April. Um, well, actually, you know, let, oh, before you answer that, let me ask: What was the norm before, and then how many did you have last fall? Okay. <laughs> so, as uh, as I mentioned with Berkeley Law, um, and I didn't go into details with uh, SFTLA, but Berkeley Law, I need a minimum of three interns um, each day, so times four days. And one time I was able to have all three interns do all four days. So that was super easy. And, and they got to know, they, they got multiple experience and they were able to be the reporter and produce rough drafts, and it got easier and easier and easier by the time the fourth day was done. But it's not possible for everybody because everybody's got a life to do all, all four days. Um, right. So it, it, it was hugely between three and I'm going to say um, 10 students who participated in my mocks, the Berkeley Law, and at SFTLA, I need four students, either two to four, because they have two simultaneous mock trials in the morning and two in the afternoon. Uh, the very first time um, interns did the SFTLA in 2013, one student did one entire day and the other one, one entire day. So I had two students. They got over 300 pages and were exhausted. So, yeah. So um, they had two, you know, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And, and those, uh, uh, you know, uh, students talk like about it because yeah, they're competing against one another. Uh, Berkeley Law is not a competition. So, Last, I, I would post, you know, photos and, you know, the results all over Facebook and students from around the U.S. would say, when you come into Pennsylvania, when you come into New York, when you come into Texas, when you come into Florida, and I would say, um, I wish I could, you know, uh, and so last year, because it was on Zoom, uh, the one with SFTLA, they use a different platform called Blue Jeans, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, anyway, I got, and I interviewed each a Zoom at least an hour apiece before I decided to allow them in. 35 interns applied. I accepted 32 from 13 states and of those 32 15 of them were reporters of record and the others were observers so you must be exhausted still <laughs> <laughs> to this day <laughs> I, I would took, be it was actually exhilarating. I mean, I spent, and, and then I had six Zooms to go over everything, and they, they got to try out how to speak up and interrupt for the record, and we went over details, um, and I also offered breathwork sessions separately before each mock, uh, and I, I, yeah, I spent over 100 hours um, on combined on everything, uh, and I was surprisingly exhilarated, not exhausted. I have not yet posted 
oh my God, I must have taken a hundred screenshots <laughs> and I haven't been able to go in yet and just select a handful to post them. I'd love to make a collage someday. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I've already got 10 uh, on the team for the upcoming uh, Berkeley Law Mocks on uh, March 16th. We're having oh, our first Zoom tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that is coming up. But I still have room. If anyone listening to this <laughs> wants to participate, go to mockwoman.com and reach out. Mockwoman.com. Thank you, Anna. So you teach students and, and working reporters uh, how to speak up for the record um, and the importance of it and why. Uh, I believe you spoke up on behalf of World Peace back in the 80s when you took a very daring trip. So why don't you tell us about that? Uh, thank you. That is a, a deeply personal experience for sure. And I, I just want to mention something that everybody who's listening to this may have already noticed, that, that my voice gets a little squiggly. Uh, and in, back in 2004, I began slurring my S's, as in Sam, and F's, like Frank, especially if a word ended with an S and began with an F or an S. And eventually, I was diagnosed with abductor spasmodic dysphonia, which I learned only in the last year is federally recognized as a disability. Spasms uh, cause my vocal cords to get stuck in the open position, which allows air to escape from my lungs as I talk. Since my vocal cords can't vibrate when they are open too far, <sighs> my voice can sound weak and breathy and squiggly, sometimes in the middle of a word. It has its own <laughs> signature sound. Uh, but obviously, that doesn't stop me from speaking, as you can <laughs> hear. <laughs> Is that a painful condition? Um, no, it's, it's really, it's made me much more conscious of my breath. So you'll hear me take a deep breath as I am reminding myself to breathe. And our breath supports our voice, obviously, right? If we don't have any breath, we don't speak. Right. So it's not painful, uh, but I do have to, you know, care for it and make sure that I'm drinking water. So you may hear me, you know, taking a sip <laughs> at some point here and there throughout this podcast. Oh, so I just, I just wanted to get that out there. It's, it's not your, you know, audio. It's me. So <laughs> anybody who's listening. And now we will go to a quick commercial break. Stay tuned. Hi, my name's Christopher Day. I've been a court reporter for 11 years. I've seen how easy it is for our profession to get buried by lots of misconceptions in the media. That's one of the reasons I started Synonymous.com, a blog all about court reporting and related issues. For example, maybe you saw in the news that court reporters were only 80% accurate when tested on a specific English dialect. Readers of my blog know that that 80% is actually twice as good as the average person and up to four times as good as automatic speech recognition. With no dialect training, we're the best. With dialect training, we're unstoppable. The news wouldn't report that, so I did. If you want honest reporting of industry events, topics, and opinions, check out Synonymous.com or search Christopher Day Blog on the web. You can subscribe, share stories, or even approach me about becoming a guest writer. Now, let's get you back to Confessions of a Stenographer. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back, Anna. So, here's my next question. Stenographers are guardians of the record. What can we do when the proceedings get out of control and everyone's talking at the same time and papers are ruffling and, you know, the door's being slammed and you want to run away from <laughs> you have to keep taking down the proceedings. <laughs> what, what, 
help. <laughs> what can we do? Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, unfortunately, speak up every time that happens is a short answer. You know, um, April, when I managed the San Francisco office of a national agency, I worked on hundreds of cases with lawyers, legal secretaries, paralegals, court reporters, videographers, and interpreters throughout the U.S. One of the most important lessons I learned as a manager is it's better to be proactive than reactive. Uh, and I'll go into that in a minute. Um, the reality, reality is we all live in our own personal bubble. Our thoughts, feelings, our to-do lists, tasks, chores, and relationships, personal and professional. We have certain expectations based on our perceptions or beliefs. Most of us are thinking about all that, including lawyers. My youngest son, as I mentioned, is a lawyer. I've worked with hundreds of them and worked for one. And they've got a thousand things on their minds. Many don't understand exactly what we do, nor do we understand exactly what they do. As I right. said, we're in our right. own bubble, right? Mm -hmm. As reporters... We need to educate and help manage attorneys and witnesses' expectations every day. And we need to manage our own expectations of them. We can't read others' minds and they can't read ours. Attorneys are tasked with zealously advocating for their clients and making the record as described in Lawyers' Rules of Professional Conduct, reporters are tasked with diligently capturing and protecting the record as detailed in various city, state, and federal rules of professional conduct. The first paragraph in the California Core Reporters Board's best practice pointer number one how to enter proceedings states, quote, the fundamental duty of a court reporter is to protect the record, including interrupting if the accuracy of the record is jeopardized. California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Division 24, Article 8, Section 2475 requires the reporter to promptly notify the parties present or the presiding officer upon determining that one is not competent to continue an assignment. Those are so powerful words. Yeah, so that's written into the code and the regulation. Exactly, so it means if you are not able to capture and protect the record, it is your duty to notify everyone present and to find somebody to replace you, basically. Who can? Right. But how many people do that? How many core yeah. reporters will notify? That would be embarrassing, right? There would be right. some shame in that, feeling Absolutely. incompetent. And you were talking about imposter syndrome. Believe me, I've got my hand up to the ceiling acknowledging that for myself. It's so awful. it is awful. I, I mean, I wrote about that in, in my group, mm -hmm. Speak Up for the mm -hmm. Record on Facebook. Yep. So I have found the easiest way to be proactive on the job is to clearly, respectfully, and politely communicate your role to set the stage for what will happen and manage everyone's expectations before you swear in the witness. So nip it in the bud, so to speak. You got it. That's exactly mm -hmm. the words. That's before right. Before the problem even happens. Exactly. So yeah. saying something like this, what I'm about to say, with a slight smile can help lighten the mood, but you don't want to be grinning. You know, a professional 
smile. Um, but genuine, don't give a fake smile or don't smile at all. Just do the resting badass face, which is my <laughs> RBF. So no, no Cheshire I, cat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like resting bitch face. Why, why use that word? That's too resting badass face or resting like boss better. face. There you okay. go. Be the boss. Okay. You're the authority. So good morning. I am Ana Fatima Costa, your core reporter today, California license number 4826. As a certified shorthand reporter for the state of California and officer of the court, it is my legal and ethical duty to interrupt. If for any reason I cannot hear or understand anyone and the record is jeopardized in order to produce a verbatim transcript. When you hear my voice, please stop and listen. Now they know what to expect from the outset. They are not as likely to be shocked when they hear a voice that's not part of the other proceedings, right? Right, right. Yeah, you've set the, you've laid out the boundaries for, you know, how, how the proceedings will, will go if you're, if you're speaking. Exactly. You are the authority in the room. You, ha- you have been authorized by the code to interrupt any time the record is in jeopardy. That is your job. And we, and we know that, you know, attorneys want the best possible transcript. So, you know, I, I know exactly. for me and, and my mom has given me lots of advice on this topic because she's been a California CSR for 31 years. Um, you know, she says, don't take it personally, you know, if they get upset because they're deep in their own thoughts. Like you said, they're zealously advocating for their client, which honestly, if I had an attorney, I would want them to be zealously advocating for me, you know? So I totally understand. Um, but you know, when it comes down to it, we're all, we all want the same thing in the end, a a clean transcript, everything, you know, verbatim transcript. So. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's very, very important for core reporters to begin regularly, consciously breathing deeply when they are on the record, before they get on the record, when they are on the record. If you're not breathing deeply, your stress hormones are through the roof. Your blood pressure goes up. And you're, you're in a state of anxiety, basically. And you're probably breathing in through your mouth, not your nose, which makes things worse. So you're not going to be able to think clearly. And oxygen is not getting to your what? Brain. The <laughs> brain and your extremities, your hands. Right. That's yeah. where you need oxygen to be, right? Yeah, because yeah, when absolutely. you're in a state of anxiety, your heart is, you know, beating really fast. And now your hands are shaking, right? Your shoulders are probably up around your ear. And, and, and you may, your hands may get freezing cold or clammy. And then you're slipping and sliding all over the keys. It's a mess, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I personally turn into Kermit typing on the typewriter. <laughs> when I'm... <laughs> When I'm losing control, it's like when I know when my whole body is going into it. Um, <laughs> exactly. Hunched over, you know. <laughs> yeah. Sausage Hunched back fingers, Notre Dame. Fingers. Yeah. And you're pounding oh, on the yeah. keys. So you're not, you're not um, using finger control. You're using way too much energy pounding right. up and down on the keys. So breathing is going to help you in a situation where People are talking over one another too fast, mumbling, whatever. Uh, and, you know, acknowledging the truth of how you feel is the first and most important key to releasing any emotions hold over you. So you need to be heard. You need to matter. You need to be respected. Okay, all of those. If you're not feeling heard, if you're not feeling understood, if you're not feeling respected or appreciated for your God only knows how many years of training and experience, 
hearts. They don't know that. You acknowledge it to yourself. And just to understand, again, we're all in our own bubble. But if you're in that situation, raise your hands over your head. Speak up politely every time you cannot hear what is said as often as you need to. On Zoom, it's obviously more difficult, like it's been a whole workshop just talking about the issues there. And there's an entire Facebook group devoted to that, but we don't have the time to go into those details. If it's actually out of control and they won't listen, stand up and tell them you need a break and you will not be able to continue if they don't stop and listen to you and then walk away. I okay. had to do that. I had to do that as a court reporter. They were, the two attorneys were almost, they were almost nose to nose over the conference room. I, I was shaking like a leaf. I could, I could see my hands. My heart was beating so fast. I thought they were going to throw uh, punches. So I put my hands over my head and I looked at both of them and I said, counsel, you will stop that right now or I'm walking. Do you hear me? Good for you. What did, how did they react? They were shocked. It was like I threw, <laughs> wa threw water on fighting dogs. And, right. <laughs> and I, I got up, walked out of the room, called my agency. They talked me down from the ceiling. And they were prepared to send someone if I needed somebody to replace me. And I just said, if they continue, I, I, I'm walking. And it was amazing. When I walked back in, they were as quiet as lambs. They got that I was serious. Nice. That's awesome. So when you do, if you need to do that, you need to take deep breaths to calm down, get away from the room, go outside if you need to, breathe that fresh air, call someone for support, your agency, let them know what's happening, and then decide where to go from there. Being reactive, the opposite of proactive, is to walk in, assume everybody should know everything, assume they should know what your job is, Get angry and resentful when they keep talking over one another and keep mumbling and keep talking like a bat out of hell. So you glare at them and expect they will understand what you need. But you don't say anything or you give up. Then you go and complain and vent about it later to everybody that will listen or on Facebook and spend hours editing the job, muttering expletives <laughs> the entire time. Why? Because your expectation is they should know what your job is and behave accordingly. But they're human and they're on their own bubbles, meeting their own needs. Right, and they're not mind readers. Yeah. So, <sighs> Now that I know how to speak up for the record and protect the record in every <laughs> possible scenario, um, why is it important to do so? And why can't we just let the audio backup get it? Mm, how, how much time have you got? <laughs> I mean, this could be an entire workshop right there. So, first, as I said earlier, and quoted from the reporter's best practice pointer number one, it is our job as a reporter to speak up whenever the record is jeopardized. You are the authority. Own it. And as you said, April, you're setting a boundary, a professional boundary. Here is the boundary, gentlemen and, 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 and ladies, ladies and gentlemen. This is my boundary. You cross this boundary, I will speak up. So going on with best practice pointer number one, how to interrupt proceedings. On page two, it states, 
The stenographic notes are the official record. If a complaint is received as to the accuracy of the transcript, the board looks to the transcript and the stenographic notes, not an audio file that may exist. In other words, do not, in all caps, rely upon your backup audio recording for transcript production. That's pretty clear. Right. Written in the rules and regulations of the board. They get probably every, yeah. every state governing court reporters. Well, I don't know. So go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. Um, since we're, you know, since they're telling us, well, at least in California, they're telling CSRs not to rely on the audio. That means they have to speak up, right? Exactly. That's the that point. Works. There's a reason why. I mean, I think we now have something like 14 or 15 best practice pointers published on the Cory Porter's board website. It's the reason why this is number one. It is the most crucial act of a court reporter is to speak up, to capture and protect the record. I mean, whether you live in California or not, why don't you want to let the audio backup get it? Well, <laughs> while audio is needed for Scopus, and it's a useful tool without any doubt for those areas where you think you heard something and then listen later and realize that you didn't capture what you thought it was. But that is if the audio works, if the background noise doesn't obliterate the speakers. If the speakers can be heard at all and aren't off their mics, etc., It should not be used as a crutch because maybe you feel more comfortable being like a potted plant and never say a word. That's great as long as you're capturing the record. But at some point, you need to speak up like when swearing in witnesses and interpreters, use that same authority to speak up for the record. Since in California, court reporters are required by law to capture and protect the record or admit to everyone in the room that they cannot, wouldn't it better serve you, your reputation and your career to speak up? Definitely, I think so. I think so too. So, Anna, do you have any suggestions or encouragement for working reporters, court reporting students, court reporting instructors, and firm owners? Oh boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to address them exactly. Students, bless you for embarking on a little known, little understood, underappreciated career as a guardian of the record. It takes courage to go through school and become a CSR, CCR, RPR, RMR, anything that you want to pursue. Courage comes from the old French word, cœur, meaning heart. And I probably totally messed that up. No, you didn't. Heart. It was, it was actually oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's been a while mm -hmm. since my five years of French. Um, <laughs> cœur means courage, comes from courage, brave. In other words, you have a brave heart to even begin studying to become a core reporter let alone going through core reporting. It takes courage and a love of steno to show up every day and confront failure as you learn what I believe to be two languages, the alphabet or, you know, theory and the keyboard with its missing four letters and then speed building and test taking and failing. 
failing does not mean you are a failure. It is an opportunity to learn. God knows I have failed countless times in so many areas of my life. Keep learning and failing forward towards your goals. Follow my golden rules in the ebook, especially the first three. Write cleanly, drop strategically, punctuate as you write, and finger drills. Doing these, you will learn to trust yourself, your fingers, your notes, and feel more confident. Find a positive reporting buddy, someone you resonate with and can trust. Support one another, share briefs, and uplift one another when you're feeling discouraged. Disregard any advice from others that is not true to your values or feels wrong. Trust your gut and your heart. Learn to breathe deeply to release anxiety, nerves, fear, and worry. This should be utilized along with your practice regimen. Meditation will also help quiet the mind. And lastly, ask for support, information, clarity. It takes courage to ask for help. It is not a sign of weakness. The opposite, it's an act of bravery an acknowledgement of an unmet need, and you are seeking to meet those needs. Now going on to working reporters. The same as I said above for students. Bless you for showing up every day. You are Steno superheroes. I mean that. I totally see a comic strip. Plus, I suggest that you read the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's a tiny book that packs a punch of truth. And I'm not going to dive deeply into each of those, the titles themselves of The Four Agreements resonate completely on their own. Agreement number one, be impeccable with your word. Do what you say you're going to do. And don't do what, you're not, what you say you're not going to do. Be careful of telling stories about yourself and about others. Like assuming that an attorney is a jerk because he doesn't want you to interrupt or because he's not listening to you. And you tell yourself a story about what his life is like and what he probably thinks, don't do that. Catch yourself doing that and stop. Agreement number two, don't take things personally. Agreement number three, don't make assumptions. I'll give an example here. If an attorney tells you he wants an expedite and you ask him, when would you like it? And he says these letters, ASAP, or as soon as possible, do not assume he means tomorrow. Cancel your job the next day, which throws your agency in, into a very stressful uh, experience trying to cover that job at the last minute. Learn to negotiate. Ask. Counsel, uh, by ASAP, what do you mean? And he may say, oh, you know, I have a brief to file. Can you get it to me by next Monday? Great. Now it's clear. If you're able to do it by next Monday, great. But think about yourself. What's going on the next few days? What's going, over, what's going on over the weekend? Are you lined up for, you know, the rest of the week? Are you going to have time to get that expedite done? Are you going away with your family over the weekend? There's no way you need to cancel that. That's important. Family time is a crucial part of being a fully happy you know, human being. You need that time away. 
So you can say, counsel, um, I'm booked the rest of the week and I'll be out of town over the weekend is uh, a week from Friday okay with you. That's how you negotiate. That is being the authority. And let me just share, oh, number four is always do your best. Uh, uh, what I learned as a manager and, and then as a sales executive working with hundreds of lawyers all over the world and their staff and court orders and videographers and interpreters for over 15 and a half years, the top two criticisms and reasons why attorneys will stop working with reporters and agencies, number one, they don't show up on time for a job. Now, what is on time? Does that mean the job is scheduled at 10? You're going to roll in at five minutes before and set up? You're late. In their mind, and actually in mine, when I was a manager, and I, and I teach this to my apprentices, show up at least a half hour ahead of time. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, when we're out and about and, you know, when we get to drive again, you have no idea what you're going to encounter on the road. You have no idea if you're in the right building or in the right conference room. You may be directed somewhere else. Some of those buildings are huge. So when you're not sitting with your butt in the seat ready to go 30 minutes ahead of time, the lawyers and their staff start to get antsy. And what if everyone else shows up early and you're the only one who's not there? They want to go on the record early because maybe something is going on after the job and they want to get going. So if you want to develop a reputation and build trust in you and be a highly sought after core reporter, show up early. Actually, it's better an hour and, and, and then begin from there. The other her. Number two, top complaint is transcripts are late. And I've noticed with the Corey Porter's board and their newsletter, uh, the biggest offense, because if you, if there's a complaint against you and the Corey Porter's board um, decides that there is a valid reason for the complaint, the number one uh, issue why Corey Porter's get disciplined is late transcripts. If you're having an issue getting a job out, let your attorneys know directly if they are your clients. Otherwise, tell your agency when they can expect to receive it right away and stick to it. They may have a brief to file with the court. If they miss the deadline to a court deadline, and I know this, believe me, I, I had sleepless nights. It was hair thin. By the time I was able to file all the documents, they are subject to a malpractice lawsuit. Will they ever call you again? Never. So keep learning and growing. Improve your writing so you can write cleanly and provide real time, which is a very important part of the future of reporting. Learn about yourself and what you need. Take breaks as you need them. Yes, it's okay to ask to take a break. Take care and protect not only the record, but your own needs, your bodily needs, your need for a break to get up, to stretch, go to the bathroom, get a drink, eat. You need to take breaks. How often? Determine how often you need it. Is it 90 minutes, two hours? If it's really rough, you may need it every hour. Determine what you need and ask for it. You could also do it at the beginning of the job. Step away from your computer and machine to give your body a break. Clear your mind, go for walks, you know, go running with your dogs, watch funny movies, create art. <laughs> if that is what you love, you need mental, physical, and emotional breaks from this very intense work of capturing the record and producing the transcript, a very lonely position that's extremely intense. If you're, if you're not happy, if you're miserable and all you do is complain, 
seek professional help. Again, it's not a weakness to ask for help. Don't bring that to your job. And lastly, celebrate yourself and all your small and big achievements. Be your own biggest fan. And cheerleader. I'm sorry? And cheerleader. And cheerleader, exactly. Yes. Now, instructors, my God, bless you for what you do. <laughs> Yours, your job is an even lesser known, appreciated, or understood part of court reporting, especially readers. You've got to multitask by watching the cutoffs, perfectly timed on your document to stay on the speed you're reading, manage your breathing, you not to see it clearly, and be mindful of not interrupting other speakers. I tried it once. That was enough. Thank you. Now, I have mentored and coached students from all over the world and read thousands of my apprentices' unedited, raw transcripts and their associated final or completed rough drafts. Many have a lot of unchance. And why is that? If what I am about to say does not apply to you, please disregard. Please, instructors, stop telling your students their sole goal is to learn to read through their slop in order to pass exams and get certified and get out there on the field because we need them. I hear their anxiety every day. It interferes with their progress. It makes them even more anxious when it's time to take tests. Slop something down for everything you hear. Don't worry about accuracy. Fix it later is an archaic principle that's been passed down for years that ultimately does not serve anyone, especially when working reporters are required to produce verbatim transcripts. When is later? Exactly. And like a the old adage says, you know, practice makes perfect. Well, perfect practice makes perfect. And error-riddled practice makes error riddled Sanskrit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so th that's why I wrote my book. You know, right cleanly, drop, repeat is golden rule number one. You write cleanly, you drop when it gets uh, beyond you, you hesitate because you can't remember a brief or you're not sure you heard a word. Pick it up as quickly as you can, write cleanly, drop. And you're doing it strategically. Pick it up as quickly as you can. You can pass an exam by doing this. If you're only dropping a word here and there or a few words here and there, you can still pass an exam. But if you're trying to hold on and you're pressuring yourself not to drop it, now you're writing slop and you're holding on to all these words and you're going to have to dump the whole thing because you're writing slop. And then your negative self-talk kicks in, starts making you doubt yourself, questioning what was that word, why, you know. You're now having a conversation with your own mind and you're no longer listening to the dictation. So there's no way you're passing that exam. Thank you so much, Anna. Hang tight, Senna lovers. We will take a quick commercial break. Christopher Day again. Just wanted to take the time to share a little more about my blog at synonymous.com. Not only do I have factual reporting, but I also dive into matters of opinion or conclusions to be drawn from the facts. For example, maybe you saw online that an automatic speech recognition company raised millions of dollars and was set to disrupt the court reporting industry. One of my posts dives right in on that. If they had a product like that, we know it would be bought out because industry giants have spent billions of dollars on far less impressive computer programs. That's just one of the ways we know they're not even close to what court reporters can do. If you like critical thinking and want to get a fresh perspective on topics like this, just make sure to check out Stenonymous.com. 
Have a great suggestion for my resource page? Write me at chris at synonymous.com. Together, we can build the industry and platform amazing content just like the podcast you're listening to now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm here with Anna Fatima So you've been in this industry for some time. I'm going to ask you the question on everyone's mind, and we will call this the million dollar question. Is pornography here to stay? <laughs> well, if you're... If you're asking me, will stenography last another 5,000 years? The short answer is no one knows. However, I can state with certainty that the mission, vision, goals, and objectives of our profession and the strategies we use to apply our skills on behalf of our clients and the judicial system comes to this. Our ability to reliably and accurately capture the spoken word at proceedings in real time is critical to democracy, the legal profession, and to effective communications. AI and other applications cannot match the work of highly trained, intelligent, critical thinking core reporters, nor is it focused on delivering such expert transcription Close enough is not good enough. Replacing human expertise, intelligence, and discernment is not possible when benchmarks are used to identify quality of work. The nuances of language, expression, and meaning can be lost in using AI. And the matter of juxtaposing our profession's proven track record of work versus claims by big tech that they can replicate anything, they cannot do so. Myriad and multiple flaws in audio capture, software, malware, lack of privacy and data collection, as well as lack of chain of custody, accountability, HIPAA compliance, etc. make alternatives tangibly insecure and not equivalent. And to those conglomerates that claim digital recording is superior to the human stenographic or voice report, it is all bluster motivated by greed. They lack integrity and underestimate real court reporters, passion, dedication, and commitment to protecting the sanctity of the record. Those attributes, values, and deep commitment can never be replicated or replaced by any machine. Most importantly, no machine or device can replace the human heart. How do you replace or measure the love we feel for our noble profession? whose sole reason for existence is to impartially capture the spoken word and provide a verbatim transcription thereof. You cannot. Very well said, Anna. How can people contact you if they want to get in touch? Thank you. I am upgrading my website, AnnaFatimaCosta.com. The best way to reach me right now is through MockWoman.com. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. And I offer a complimentary coaching session to students and reporters. If you're suffering, you are not alone. It would be my honor to help you find comfort, feel heard, and know that you matter. Anna, do you have any last words? You know, part of my spiritual practice is gratitude. I am grateful for each day that I am blessed to live and for everyone and everything. And I am grateful to have been invited to share my story and work on this platform. Thank you, Shanice, and thank you, April. It is an honor to know you both. I echo every syllable. Thanks, Shanice, for having me as a co-host, and thank you, Anna, for asking me to interview you. I would like to thank everyone that took the time to check out this podcast. You are all appreciated. This podcast was designed for you and to add value to our profession. Until then, stay motivated and encouraged.